I find it fascinating that centuries ago, many of the words that we now use in our everyday language had completely different meanings from our modern understandings. This video was taken on November 5th, 2017 at the Lewis Bonfire in Enbridge, England. And for those of you who are English probably already know what this is and what they are burning. What they are burning is an effigy of Guy Fox, a man who was one of the Catholic conspirators that tried and failed to blow up the House of Lords in 1605. And Guy Fox, a man whose features today are often depicted in a popular mask, has his effigy symbolically burned every year in celebration for England's defeat of the Catholic resistance. And back in the day, these effigies, which are made of straw or other flammable materials, were called guys, and that is the original meaning of the word. And for 400 years, the word guy was only significantly used on November 5th since that was the night of the celebration. However, somewhere along the way, the word guy changed. Along with its original meaning, the word guy was also used as an insult to describe a poorly dressed man. But even more time passed, and the word was no longer derogatory, and guy was rather used to describe any man. Today, the word guy can be used for anyone as a gender-neutral term, especially when used in the plural. Now, no one really knows exactly when people transitioned to using the word according to our modern definition, but most agree it took around 200 years. And 200 years sounds long, but it's not too unusual since there have been many other words in our English language that took centuries to transform to our contemporary understandings. However, times have changed, and in our internet age of fast and widespread communication, definitions of words are changing much more rapidly and in much shorter time frames. And now, we are seeing the meanings of words change right before our very eyes. During the years 2020 and 2021, I, along with millions of other viewers, religiously watch videos like these. These videos, although having been filmed by different people at different locations, all pretty much present the same thing. Or should I say they all present the same person? The person we see in these videos is a type of person who, over the past few years, has become an archetype of the most popular internet meme to have ever existed. And that person can be described as the MVP of unnecessary public tantrums and tirades. She's known to be entitled, rude, demanding, and aggressive, and will cause an uproar at the most minor inconvenience. There are also times she can be racist and on occasion even violent. Although she is not a representative of all middle-aged white women, social observations have indicated that she is part of a certain segment within that demographic. We all know who she is. She is, of course, the Karen. For years now, I, like most everyone, have enjoyed watching these Karen videos. Admittedly, it's fun to watch people be ridiculed, and we can all agree that these wrongdoers are deserving of public disdain. I could enjoy these videos guilt-free because I could deduce from my observations that these Karens were unjustifiable in their actions which resulted in harm to others. Therefore, in a way, the public ridicule that the Karens received from these videos almost felt like retribution. But now in 2022, I'm not getting the same enjoyment watching these videos that I did the previous years, since more and more videos seem to be assigning the name Karen to people that seem to have no association to its original meaning. What was once a pejorative term designated to those demonstrating clear abhorrent behavior no longer seems to be the case. Karen is now so overused and misused that the word is starting to become hackneyed. So for this video, I'm going to discuss how the meaning of the word Karen is changing rapidly and arguably devolving. And in order to do so, I'll first need to start from the beginning. I'll discuss the history of the meme and its origin. Karen began as a satirical social commentary on angry middle-aged white women that were observed acting afoul in public. Therefore, I'll provide my own theories as to why I think these observations were and have been so common, and what that might tell us about our culture. So that said, Let's discuss the ever-changing Karen. In the United States, the use of derogatory slang terms to describe certain people within the white female population is certainly not a new phenomenon. Miss Anne, for instance, a black vernacular English term to describe wealthy and entitled white women, was commonly used amongst the working class black community in 1920s Harlem. The word Miss Anne may have originated as far back as the mid 19th century, and was a word often designated to white women 
who accuse black people of crimes without reasoning or warrant. But unlike Karen, that is specific to middle-aged white women, or at least was originally, as we'll get into later, Miss Anne was a term that encompassed younger white women as well, and sometimes was used even to refer to black women who engaged in similar behavior. Some have theorized that Karen is a modern derivative of Miss Anne, and therefore Karen was initially a part of black American vernacular English. I, however, was unable to find any concrete evidence to confirm this. Nevertheless, we do see in multiple Karen videos examples of women calling the police on black people for minor infractions without warrant. And based on the videos, many of these incidents appear to be racially motivated. That said, whether or not Karen was originally part of black vernacular English, the usage of Miss Anne possibly influenced our modern day language, thus paving the way for Karen to appear in our vocabulary today. However, others theorize that the word didn't originate from a community but rather credit Karen to one person. For instance, some online discussion forums have claimed that stand-up comic Dane Cook invented the word Karen in his 2005 comedy special, Retaliation. In his bit titled The Friend No One Likes, Dane states that there is one person in the friend group that no one likes, and he calls that person Karen. Now in the bit, Dane merely calls this hypothetical Karen a douchebag, and doesn't really get any more substantive than that. Example. Karen is always a douchebag. Every group has a Karen, and she's always a bag of douche. That said, although I believe there could be a connection, it appears tenuous at best. Along with the Dane Cook theory, others credit the word to a Redditor called Karma Cop 9, who in 2017 extensively ranted about his ex-wife Karen. However, just like the Dane Cook theory, there is no concrete evidence to prove this. Now, the origin story that makes the most sense to me is very simple, but I believe most plausible. And that is that the name Karen was just the one that stuck during the time that all these Karen-esque memes were being created. For those of you who frequented the internet in the 2010s, recall that before Karen, there were many other memes floating around the internet mocking middle-aged white women freaking out in public. And in these memes, names such as Barbecue Betty, Cornisaur Caroline, and Permit Patty were used to identify these women that were caught in the act of a public freakout. Therefore, it seems that people around this time were searching for the catchiest, stereotypical, white, middle-aged female name, and Karen became the victor. And I think the same can be said about the Karen's likeness, which also likely originated from another meme. I think it's safe to say that when most people think of a Karen, what usually comes to mind is an A-line haircut with bleach blonde highlights. Therefore, there is a general consensus that the Karen meme was an offspring of the earlier May I Speak to the Manager meme, dating back to 2015. But that being said, everything that is on the internet originates from something observable in real life, so the same has to be said for the Karen and her likeness. A lot of people have speculated that Kate Gosselin from John K Plus 8 inspired the creation of the May I Speak to the Manager meme, and some have even gone as far as to say that she is the original Karen. For one, she had a hairstyle that was popular with middle-aged women, especially in the aughts and early teens, and this hairstyle was often subject to mockery by comedians. Secondly is how she's represented on the program. Kate often exhibited some Karen behaviors such as being short-tempered, being demanding, and one time even admitted to physically abusing John. Nevertheless, whatever the origins may be, most people agree that Karen started to become mainstream in late 2017 due to a wide dissemination of these kinds of still image memes. And as videos gradually became more popular over still image memes, a massive influx of videos documenting women having public tantrums began to flood the internet. And when the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the world in 2020 and 2021, the Karen sensation even got bigger. One obvious reason for this was that everyone was on lockdown and using their phones for entertainment. But in addition to that, this is a time where the decision of whether or not to wear a face mask became a heated political topic. So heated, in fact, that many people felt inclined to act outrageously in public. Now in these videos, we saw that the freakouts were not specific to people of a particular political party, as both people on the right and the left were acting out of line. However, there was a noticeable similarity regarding the aggressor in all these videos. And that was, that in all these videos, the aggressor was often female, middle-aged, and white. 
Now, I'm certainly not trying to say that there's an inherent issue with middle-aged white women, and I personally find that argument disingenuous as well as just plain lazy. In the grand scheme of things, the people who are filmed only make up a small portion of this large demographic. After all, there are over 7 billion people in this world with cameras on their phones. Therefore, recordings of outrageous incidents is inevitable. Furthermore, as I will dive deeper into later, people have incentives like getting a lot of views. So of course people were biased and chose to film people who had stereotypical Karen features. But that all being said, it's very odd that a large number of people that were recorded having these tantrums, whether it be with customers or kids on the sidewalk, often seem to be within the same demographic. And although this is completely anecdotal, during my days of installing cable in 2014, the small minority of customers that were naggy, rude, and demanding were more likely to be middle-aged, female, and white. It therefore makes me wonder if there is an explanation for this observable phenomenon. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that the reasons why Karens are so resentful is because they all have a sense of entitlement. Now, although I believe that having a sense of entitlement is a part of it, I don't believe that it entirely explains the Karen disposition. I say that because a lot of people in Western society who wouldn't necessarily be labeled as Karens would still be described as entitled. Admittedly, we are all a little bit spoiled living in a time where we can get anything we want delivered to us seven days a week. Therefore, there must be another reason that is driving these Karens to act so outrageously. Perhaps they are not merely entitled, but perhaps they are also very angry and resentful. Now let me be clear that what I'm about to say next is merely my hypothesis, and this theory, of course, does not apply to all people who are within the white, female, middle-aged demographic. That being said, I believe that if we look at the culture and upbringing of white, middle-aged American women, we may see some reasons as to why a segment of this population appears to be so resentful. Karens of today, being middle-aged, were children of the 60s and 70s, which was a very unique time to be born for American women, particularly white American women. Prior to the 60s, white women, especially married white women, were generally discouraged from working outside the home. We see many infamous propaganda films from the 1950s depicting the ideal woman as the perfect housewife, that is one who cooks, cleans, and looks her best, but never in a million years would we expect her to pick up a wrench. Now in the films, these women all look like joyful mothers, but as we all know, in reality, this was often not the case. Since all the important financial decisions and responsibilities were designated to the husband, many of these women felt dissatisfied, restrained, and powerless. And this was the norm for many white American families for generations. But in the 1960s, everything was turned upside down. With the emergence of the second wave feminist movement, there would be massive changes in both our government and culture. This movement would last all the way to the early 80s, and during this time came about laws such as the Equal Pay Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and the list goes on. And along with government mandates, there was a major change to the general public attitude with respect to women in the workplace. Unlike girls that grew up in the 50s and before, girls of the 60s, 70s, and thereafter were encouraged to get educated and find a career. And these women did just that, since female participation in the workforce skyrocketed. And this increase was especially true for white women. In 1950, for instance, only around 28% of white women were in the workforce. But by 1990, that number nearly doubled to almost 60%. This percentage from 1990 is even more significant when we look at data from years prior, showing that the percentages were even lower, with only around 16% of white women in the workforce in 1890, and around 22% were in the workforce in 1920. Therefore, many middle-aged white women of today were the first in their families to find a career. And for these women, these opportunities were enthralling. Unlike their mothers who grew up confined to the household, the women of this generation would be out making their own income, 
With that, they would also have equal control of the finances and have influence over other important decisions that were previously designated to their male counterparts. However, despite these radical changes, there were still traditional values that remained in place, since women were still encouraged and oftentimes expected to get married and have children. This blend of both New Age and traditional values presented new goals and aspirations for all women. That is, in order for a woman to be happy and fulfilled, she must be both a mother and a successful businesswoman. Unfortunately for many women, these wonderful dreams and aspirations of having it all turned out to be total nightmares. After the 60s, women were now officially part of the rat race, and like their husbands, they too were subject to hour-long commutes and traffic to their 8-6 to six jobs. However, unlike their husbands, there was still an underlying expectation that these women were going to be the homemakers, and therefore would keep most of the responsibility when it came to raising children. Coming home from a stressful workday to a pile of dirty dishes in the sink and a baby's diaper that needed changing came to be the norm. And as the years went by, many women realized that this life of a full-time working mother was no longer a revolutionary dream come true, but in reality, a monotonous hell. They began to get tired, resentful, and angry that this promise of a happy life was all just a ruse, and that in the end, they too were just like their mothers, and did not have much control over their own lives. There's an old saying that hurt people hurt people, and I believe this holds true for the Karens. I believe that these Karens are hurt and resentful that their lives didn't turn out the way they expected. And having grown up with these false promises that they would finally have control over their lives, has made them today absolutely obsessed with getting control over anything and everything they can, especially control over anybody who tries to defy them. That is why the Karen gets so belligerent over little inconveniences, like an incorrect food order or a kid at a lemonade stand without a permit. It all comes down to them trying to regain that control, because if they don't, they will be a doormat just like their mother's. Now, although I stand by my theory, I want to make clear that I'm certainly not arguing that we should revert back to traditional family structures, and neither am I critical of people who choose to have a traditional household. I think that everyone should live their lives the way that works for them, and makes them feel happy, whether that be traditional, modern, or unconventional. So that said, the point I'm rather making is that I believe that a lot of white American women that grew up during this time were unprepared for the cultural transition that was occurring where a working mother would become the norm. Recall how I mentioned earlier that only around 16% of white female Americans were in the workforce in 1890. This is already a very small number. When you look at the percentages of married white American females that were working at this time, the numbers are even more abysmal. In 1890, a mere 2.5% of married white women were in the workforce, and in 1920, it only increased to 6.5%. I find this especially interesting since if we compare these statistics to non-white working females, the numbers aren't nearly as drastic. Between 1890 to 1950, the percentage of non-white females who participated in the workforce was not only higher than whites, but consistently around 40% throughout these 60 years. Non-white married females were also way more likely to participate in the workforce than white females, with 22.5% in the workforce in 1890 and 32.5% in 1920. It therefore appears that due to economic, societal, cultural, and other factors, that a significant number of non-white married women were already in the workforce decades prior to the second wave feminist movement. American economist Janet Yellen actually wrote on this subject in a May 2020 essay. And in that essay, she stated that in the early 20th century, African American women were about twice as likely to participate in the labor force as were white women at the time, largely because black women remained in the labor force after marriage. Now it's true that women, both single and married, white and non-white, joined the workforce in much greater numbers during the second wave feminist movement. However, it is also true that non-white married women were working in significant numbers prior to the movement. Perhaps the 60s movement was not as a dramatic change for non-white married women, since non-white families had generations of women before them who had already been in the workforce. Perhaps non-white married mothers were given the guidance and skills passed down through these generations as to how to manage two full-time jobs, that is being a mother and being in the workforce. 
And just maybe, because they had such knowledge passed down from generations, non-white women had an idea as to what they were going to expect, and therefore didn't turn out so lost and resentful. And of course, I'm not saying that non-white women didn't have problems to deal with after the 1960s, but maybe, because they had other family around them that shared these same experiences, they were able to handle these transitions much better, which is partly why we don't see as many non-white Karens being recorded. Now, although I think there is some basis to indicate this connection, I do admit that other than an unreliable poll or questionnaire, there's no clear way to prove this theory. I also admit that there is a problem with the assumption that most of these Karens are working mothers. Although I have observed in these videos Karens that are working mothers, there are a lot of Karens out there that don't work or are childless. Therefore, there has to be an explanation for their behavior as well. Admittedly, there have been times in my life where I've been irritated with service workers, whether it was an incompetent mechanic, a dismissive waiter, or the rude guy at the DMV. But when I've had these moments of irritation, I did not react and kept my feelings to myself. Now, I'd like to think that I don't react outwardly in these situations because I'm such a good guy. But if I'm being really honest with myself, I believe a big part of it is because I'm worried about what others will think of me. I don't want someone to think I'm an idiot, or even worse, I don't want someone to punch me in the face. However, the Karens don't seem to think this way. Not only do they think their freakouts will come without consequences, it's almost as if they think that they will receive applause for their behavior. Now, it's hard to imagine how anyone in their right mind could think that this behavior is cute. But when you look at how this type of demographic was historically presented in film and television, then it makes sense how many would think that their attitudes are socially acceptable. As more and more women joined the workforce after the 60s, television, film, and radio began to change. And by the 80s, it started to become clear that a large portion of television films were specifically tailored to a female audience. The reason being was that a much larger portion of the population had control of the finances, and thus there was a large new audience to sell products to. However, as is very evident today, many media production companies are disconnected from what audiences really want. And in their attempt to get a hold of a large female audience, they created the film and television tropes that we all despise. One of the most famous ones that come to mind is the attractive but bitchy wife with an unattractive dumb husband. In these shows' cheap attempts at bringing the audience relatable humor, the wife will often despise the husband for his unrelenting stupidity. In this pursuit of comedy, she will insult his physique while also belittling him over the most minor things. We see this trope most often in 90s sitcoms, but it's also very prevalent in films of the early O's. And in these films, she's not only impatient with her lobotomized husband, but she is also very combative with literally anyone who tries to step in her way. During this time period, this type of female representation may have been even worse in radio. Nearly every radio station had an identical format, and every radio host was an identical caricature. There was always one or two, and I say this in quotes, edgy funny guys, as well as one woman who was there to destroy all the fun and keep the guys in check. That being said, I don't think that a silly radio show is going to make one a Karen, but if you're already unhappy and resentful, and everything you watch and listen to is sending the same message, and that message is it's funny and attractive to be unnecessarily domineering, then perhaps you might think that it's socially acceptable to be the asshole that you truly are. However, I think it's important to add that we can't always blame the actress for these types of portrayals because a lot of the development of these characters go behind the scenes. For instance, even a show that I love almost fell into this trap. In the first season of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, the character Dee Reynolds is portrayed completely different from the erratic narcissist of the subsequent series. In the first season, she comes off as the stern voice of reason, playing into the character trope of the 90s and O's. Luckily, Caitlin Olsen, as the actress that plays Dee, put her foot down and told the rest of the guys that her character was shit and not funny. Now, fortunately, the creator of the show, Rob McElhenney, listened to Caitlin and they ended up abandoning that cliché tired bit. 
and because he listened, Dee became another hilarious character on the show. Now going back to the Karen, I think that media not only influenced how middle-aged white women perceived themselves, but how the general public perceived middle-aged white women. Now, I'm not going to go as far as saying that middle-aged white women were targeted, but it is plausible to assume the possibility that since middle-aged white women were the majority that were getting these cringe roles, it furthered the stereotype that these women were bitchy and a destroyer of all joy and fun. There's a possibility that we as a society were unknowingly trained to be on high alert when having interactions with people within this demographic. And since we are complicated and sensitive beings, the Karens could sense our defensive reactions, which further put fuel to the fire. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that the Karen sensation became massive after lockdown, since this was a time where there was a high demand for entertainment and the public was being largely deprived. And during these crazy times where a lot of people's tensions were running high, Crazy Karens and the content they provided was in great supply. In many ways, the Karens were, and still are, a hot commodity. In our post-pandemic world in 2022, there's surprisingly still a high demand for Karen content. Just plug in the words Karen on the TikTok search engine, and you'll get dozens if not hundreds of videos that were created just within the last month. The Karen sensation is therefore still very much popular post-pandemic, so much so that a Karen-themed restaurant chain called Karen's Diner popped up just last year in 2021. And Karen's Diner has opened 13 locations throughout Australia and New Zealand, and are planning to open 13 new locations in the United States. In fact, a lot of the videos on TikTok with the Karen hashtag are not actual Karen videos, but videos of the Karen caricatures that waitress at this restaurant chain. And this brings me to my next point which is that although there is evidently much demand for Karen content in 2022, it seems that the demand far outweighs the supply of actual Karens in real life. It appears recently there is many if not more alternative forms of Karen videos than actual videos of Karens documented in public. For instance, many of the Karen videos we see now are fictional representations of the Karen, and many middle-aged women on social media that have the Karen look are starting to capitalize on the market for Karen satire. And honestly, kudos to them, I'm all for this. And in fact, if I were to criticize anyone for doing satire, that would be the epitome of the pot calling the kettle black. That said, it does seem like creators and distributors of Karen content are coming up with alternative ways to fulfill the public's craving for women freaking out in public, since it seems like not enough instances are getting captured on camera. Now this isn't an issue when the creators fulfill the public's need with Karen satire videos, but what becomes troublesome is when creators start using real-life innocent people as a substitution to real Karens, all in order to capitalize on this hot commodity. When I watch recent videos of Karens documented public, I notice these videos all share certain patterns. One thing I notice now is a lot of these videos start mid-argument between the Karen and the victim, or is often left ambiguous as to what they are even arguing about or who instigated the argument first. And in some videos, it's not even hidden that the so-called Karen was the one who was initially provoked, and that the one filming has an obvious motive at getting her to react. This is especially prevalent in prank videos, where we often see young men harassing women who work in customer service. I find these videos particularly ironic, since in the beginning of this online trend, recall that it was the customer service workers that were considered to suffer the most from the Karens. However, now, Many videos attempt to present the opposite. I've also noticed that the term Karen is no longer just assigned to middle-aged white women, but now is also used to refer to young women, non-white women, and even men. Now, when I first noticed this pattern sometime last year, I was actually optimistic, since it seemed like the term was expanding to encompass all people who had quintessential Karen behaviors. And I was hopeful about the future of the term, since the stereotype of the middle-aged angry white woman was starting to become tired and outdated. But my previous optimism is now long gone. That is because the new demographic of Karens depicted in these videos, as well as the original demographic, are often not acting like Karens. Rather, they are literally anyone who shows the slightest bit of emotion or protest during a frustrating situation. And what is arguably worse are the videos that are recording people freaking out 
who appeared to be suffering from a severe mental illness. It's a cheap and harmful substitution, like selling fentanyl for heroin. People don't realize or care to think that actual people are behind these videos with jobs, families, and reputations that can be incredibly damaged from just one post. Now fortunately, a lot of people are not buying into it, and you can see in some of the comments that people are getting sick and tired of this name being thrown around so carelessly. But despite the opponents, the fact of the matter is, a lot of people are still watching and liking these videos in high numbers just because the trend is popular. For as much as I blame the content creators for this perpetuation of cheap content, we as the audience all continue to consume it. I mentioned earlier that during the production of film and television during the 90s and O's, a lot of Karens got a little full of themselves. Now in our age of social media, perhaps we are too. Perhaps we are creating our own hacky trope, that of a young carefree person being shut down by a Karen who keeps destroying all the fun. It almost seems like we enjoy being victimized since it gives us the justification to fire back and gives us this feeling that a sense of justice has been served. But nowadays, it seems that justice is rarely served and the only thing that is gained is one's own personal satisfaction. It makes you wonder, who really are the Karens nowadays? Now before I end this video, I want to make clear that I'm not saying that we should devote our attention to crucifying these New Age Karens, and neither am I saying that people are never worthy of criticism online. But I do believe that whenever we do happen to run across somebody who we think is deserving of ridicule, we should always ask ourselves something first. That is, what is the ultimate motive? Do we really want justice, or do we just really yearn to burn someone at the stake?